So this is going to be a brief review of the cardiovascular system. For those of you that aren't familiar with the cardiovascular system, I would suggest to review uh, maybe a basic anatomy course. The purpose of these lecture slides are really to just kind of remind you and make you familiar with the key concepts that are going to be important for future videos on exercise and the cardiovascular system. This all to say that this is not a comprehensive review. So let's start with what's really the superstar of the cardiovascular system, the heart. The primary function of the heart is to pump blood with various nutrients and oxygen to the cells of the body. Despite this extremely important function, the heart is relatively small, only about the size of your fist. That being said, the size of the heart is dependent on several factors. These factors include body size, for example, a larger body will usually have a larger heart. Then there's genetics. So some people are just born genetically to have larger hearts than others. Then there's exercise training status. As one might assume, if you exercise more, you're more likely to have a larger heart. We will go into the reasons for this in future lectures. And then finally, we have the presence of disease. While an increase in the size of the heart uh, would predominantly seem like a good thing, in some cases, like pathologies, it's considered a bad thing. So now let's talk about the basic physiology of the cardiovascular system, or really the big picture. As you can see here, the cardiovascular system is made up of two pumps, and essentially two circuits. These circuits include the systemic circuit, which essentially pumps blood throughout the entire body, and the pulmonary circuit which pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs to be reoxygenated. So with all of that in mind, how do we control our heart? So we have two main categories for how the heart is controlled. The first of which is intrinsic conduction. You can think of intrinsic conduction as how the heart itself controls its own beating. This mechanism starts at the top of the heart with the sinoatrial node, which is also sometimes called the pacemaker cell. The sinoatrial node is often called the pacemaker cell due to its ability to depolarize on its own. This essentially means that the heart can beat without any type of input from your nervous system. From the sinoatrial node, this action potential is transmitted down to the bottom of the heart, at which point the action potential goes along the sides of the heart's walls, causing contractions that allow the heart to pump blood to both, again, the systemic and the pulmonary system. So now let's talk about our second category of heart control, extrinsic conduction. Extrinsic conduction essentially just refers to outside inputs that control the rate at which the heart beats. This diagram provides an excellent example of extrinsic conduction. As you can see, uh, baroreceptors and carotid body chemoreceptors provide sensory inputs to the brain the spinal cord to essentially indicate that blood pressure is either too high or too low. In response, the brain can then respond by either activating the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system. These sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system can innervate the heart with parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve fibers that will either cause the pacemaker cell to contract or uh, essentially depolarize more or less frequently. The brain can also decide to have the body release certain hormones that can increase or decrease heart rate uh, in a more sustained and long-term manner. So what do we mean by parasympathetic and sympathetic activation? Well, I always like to start with what is your normal heart rate? What would your heart rate be at if it was essentially not connected to your body. And scientists have actually tested this and they found that uh, on average, if your heart rate is not connected to your nervous system, it would just randomly depolarize and beat at a rate of about 100 beats per minute. However, thankfully, our heart is not detached from the rest of our body and therefore it is innervated by both our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is really uh, the nervous system that takes over when you're really resting and recovering, and it results in a decrease in your heart rate. The parasympathetic nervous system is really in control when your heart rate is below 100 beats per minute. 
Meanwhile, your sympathetic nervous system is really your fight or flight response. Uh, it results in an increase in heart rate and vasodilation as well as several other factors and is the predom predominant uh, control of your heart rate uh, when your heart rate is above 100 beats per minute. Also, as you might have guessed, uh, your sympathetic nervous system is really what is active when we're exercising, while your parasympathetic nervous system is when, again, you're resting and recovering from a bout of physical activity. So what is your heart rate? Essentially, your heart rate is the number of times your heart pumps in a minute. You guys are probably aware of this. Um, these are also kind of some clinical terms for uh, heart rate or resting heart rate. So if your heart rate or resting heart rate is above 100 beats per minute, that usually is indicative of tachycardia, while a resting heart rate below 60 beats per minute is bradycardia. These are both considered um, essentially pathological. However, uh, athletes are also usually shown to have bradycardia or a heart rate or resting heart rate below 60 beats per minute. However, this is not necessarily considered to be a negative factor. So with all that in mind, I want to go over some really uh, important key concepts for just uh, future videos that are really important to understand. Uh, the first is stroke volume, which is essentially the amount of blood uh, that your heart pumps every time it beats. And this is extremely important uh, for exercise as well as looking at the effects of exercise on the heart. One of the main effects that exercise has on stroke volume is an increase in the size and strength of the heart, which results in a greater contraction and therefore a greater stroke volume. Then we have cardiac output, which is really just the total amount of blood that your body essentially pumps every minute. Uh, cardiac output is the result of the number of times your heart beats uh, every minute multiplied by your stroke volume, or the total amount of blood that is pumped in each of those uh, beats. So some things to keep in mind and that are kind of interesting. Uh, first of all, at rest, our body pumps about five liters of blood per minute. Now the average uh, male and female has about four to five liters of blood in their entire body. So if you think about that, at rest, we're pumping our entire body's worth of blood uh, throughout our whole system in just one minute. And then the second factor is, is when we're exercising, uh, our cardiac output is about 25 liters of blood per minute. So we're pumping about five times our total blood volume in a single minute when exercising, which is uh, pretty cool, pretty fascinating. So where does that blood all go? Uh, as you can kind of see in this diagram, uh, different portions of our body receive different proportions of our total cardiac output, whether we're at rest or exercising. As you might kind of think already, uh, something like your digestive system receives a lot greater percentage of your total blood volume and cardiac output uh, when you're at rest, while it decreases significantly when exercising. Meanwhile, something like our skeletal muscle gets a lot less blood at rest than it does when exercising. Our cardiovascular system's ability to shunt blood to certain regions of the body, as well as moderate the uh, total cardiac output that we have, is vital and is extremely important in understanding uh, our ability to exercise in general. So that was essentially a brief overview of the general aspects of the cardiovascular system. I really want to emphasize that this is only a brief overview. There is uh, much more to discuss about the cardiovascular system. However, for the purpose of exercise physiology, I thought I'd start with these specific points. That being said, maybe in the future I can make a more in-depth video, uh, but again, these concepts are important for any future exercise physiology videos that I produce on the cardiovascular system. Uh, so if you do have any questions, though, feel free to leave them in the comments. Uh, I can go a little bit more in depth in other factors of the cardiovascular system, as well as anything I talked about in this review. Uh, that's all. Thanks for listening. Have a nice day.